Hello and welcome to the second part of the occipital lobe series. In this session, I'm going to talk about a theory of occipital lobe function, visual functions beyond the occipital lobe, vision for action, action for vision, visual recognition, visual space, and visual attention. A theory of occipital lobe function. We have seen that areas V1 and V2 are functionally heterogeneous and that both segregate processing for color, form and motion. The heterogeneous functions of area V1 and V2 contrast with the functions of the area that follow in the hierarchy. In a sense, area V1 and V2 appear to serve as little mailboxes into which different types of information are assembled before being sent on to the more specialized visual areas. From areas V1 and V2 flow three parallel pathways that convey different attributes of vision. The information derived from the blob areas of area V1 goes to area V4 considered to be a color area. Cells in area V4 are not solely responsible to color. However, some cells respond to both form and color. Other information from area V1 also goes to area V2 and then to area V5, which is specialized to detect motion. Finally, an input from areas V1 and V2 to area V3 is concerned with the Zeki calls dynamic form, that is, the shape of objects in motion. Thus, we see that vision begins in the primary cortex or the V1 area, which has multiple functions and then continues in the more specialized zones. It is not surprising to discover that selective lesions up the hierarchy in areas V3, V4 and V5 produce specific deficits in the visual processing. People who suffer damage to area V4 are able to see only in shades of grey. Curiously, patients not only fail to perceive colors but also fail to recall colors from before their injuries or even to imagine colors. In a real sense, the loss of area V4 results in the loss of color cognition or the ability to think about the color. Similarly, a vision in area V5 produces an inability to perceive objects in motion. Objects at rest are perceived but when the objects begin to move, they vanish. In principle, a lesion in area V3 will affect form perception but area V4 also processes form. A rather large lesion of both V3 and V4 would be required to eliminate form perception. An important constraint on the functions of area V3, V4 and V5 is that all these areas receive major input area from V1. People like Colonel PM with lesions in area V1 act as though they are blind, but visual input can still get through to higher levels. Partly through small projections of the lateral geniculate nucleus to area V2 and partly through projections from the colliculus to the thalamus or the pulvina to the cortex. People with V1 lesions seem not to be aware of the visual input and can be shown to have some aspects of vision only by special testing. Thus, when asked what they see, patients with V1 damage often reply that they see nothing. Nonetheless, they can act on visual information indicating that they do indeed see. Area V1 thus appears to be primary for vision in yet another sense. V1 must function for the brain to make sense out of what the more specialized visual areas are processing. We must note, however, reports of people with significant V1 damage were capable of some awareness of visual information such as motion. Barber and colleagues suggested that integrity of area V3 may allow this conscious awareness but this suggestion remains a hypothesis. Visual functions beyond the occipital lobe Neuroscientists have known since the early 1900s that the occipital lobe house vision. 
but only in the past two decades have begun to understand the extent of visual processing that takes place beyond the occipital lobes. In fact, it is now clear that more cortex is concerned with vision than with any other function in the primate brain. Philemon and Van Essen's flattened cortical map describes the 32 cortical areas of a total of about 70 in their scheme that have visual functions in the monkey brain. Only 9 are actually in the occipital lobe. The total surface of the visual related regions is about 55% of the whole cortical surface which compares with 11% and 3% for the somatosensory and auditory regions. It is interesting that so little of the monkey cortex represents audition, which is certainly evidence of a major difference between the brains of humans and those of monkeys. We humans have a much larger auditory representation which is no doubt responsible for our preoccupation with both language and music. Visual processing in humans therefore does not culminate in secondary visual areas such as V3, V4 and V5 but continues within multiple visual regions in the parietal, temporal and frontal lobes. Function have not been assigned to all these additional visual regions but it is possible to speculate on what their functions must be. To do so, we can divide visual phenomena into five general categories. Vision for action, action for vision, visual recognition, visual space and visual attention. Vision for action. This category is visual processing required to direct specific movement. For example, when reaching for a particular object such as a cup, the fingers form a specific pattern that allows grasping of the cup. This movement is obviously guided by vision because people do not need to shape their hands consciously as they reach. In addition to that for grasping, there must be visual areas that guide all kinds of specific movements including those of eyes, head and whole body. A single system could not easily guide all movements because the requirements are so different. Reaching to pick up a jelly bean requires a very different kind of motor control that required to duck from a snowball, but both are visually guided. Finally, visions for action must be sensitive to movement of the target. Catching a moving ball requires specific information about the location, trajectory, speed and shape of the object. Vision for action is thought to be a function of the parietal visual areas. Action for vision. In a more top-down process, the viewer actively searches for only part of the target object and attends it selectively. When we look at the visual stimulus, we do not simply stare at it. Rather, we scan the stimulus with numerous eye movements. These movements are not random but tend to focus on important or distinct features of the stimulus. When we scan a face, we make a lot of eye movements directed towards the eye and mouth. Curiously, we also make more eye scans directed to the left visual field, the right side of the person's face, than to the right visual field. This scanning bias may be important in the way that we process faces because it is not found in the scanning of other stimuli. People with deficits in action for vision are likely to have significant deficits in visual perception although such deficits have not been studied systematically. An interesting aspect of action for vision consists of the eye movement that we often make when we visualize information. For example, when people are asked to rotate object mentally in order to answer simple questions about the object's appearance, they usually make many eye movements, especially to the left. When people are doing things in the dark, such as windling photographic film into spools for processing, they also make many eye movements. Curiously, if the eyes are closed, these movements stop. Indeed, it appears that it is easier to do many tasks in the dark if the eyes are closed. Because things are done by touch in the dark, the visual system may interfere until the eyes are closed. Visual Recognition we enjoy the ability both to recognize objects and to respond to visual information. 
For example, we can both recognize specific faces and discriminate and interpret different expressions in those faces. Similarly, we can recognize letters or symbols and assign meaning to them. We can recognize different foods, tools or body parts, but it is not reasonable to expect that we have different visual regions for each category or object. We may have at least some specialized areas for biologically significant information, such as faces. However, cells in the temporal cortex appear to be highly specific in their preference for particular faces or hands. These visual areas in the temporal lobe are specialized for visual recognition. Visual Space Visual information comes from specific locations in space. This information allows us to direct our movements to objects in space and to assign meaning to objects. But spatial locations is not a unitary characteristic. Objects have location both relative to an individual or egocentric space and relative to one another or the allocentric space. Egocentric visual space is central to the control of your actions towards objects. It therefore seems likely that visual space is coded in neural systems related to vision for action. In contrast, allocentric properties of objects are necessary for you to construct a memory of spatial location. A key feature of allocentric spatial coding is that it depends on the identity of particular features of the world. Thus, it is likely to be associated with the regions of the visual recognition. In summary, different aspects of the spatial processing probably take place in both the parietal and the temporal visual regions, and respective functions are integrated in areas that interact and exchange information. Visual Attention We cannot possibly process all the visual information available. A page has shape, color, texture, location, and so on. But the only really important characteristic is that it has words. Thus, when we read the page, we select a specific aspect of visual input and attend to it selectively. In fact, neurons in the cortex show various attentional mechanisms. For example, neurons may respond to selectively to stimuli in particular places or at particular times or if a particular movement is to be executed. Independent mechanisms of attention are probably required both for the guidance of movement in the parietal lobe and for the object recognition in the temporal lobe.